Okay, everyone. Um, welcome to Napa and welcome to Member Summit. This is the 20th year of my good friend Jim Zemlin's uh, anniversary of working with the Linux Foundation. So, about 20 years ago, Linux and open source was really not very welcome in companies. And a lot of people thought it was unsafe and uh, it wasn't enterprise ready. And so there were these two little organizations called Open Source Development Labs and Free Software Group that were formed to take Linux forward. And the young Jim Zemlin, as you can see, <laughs> joined OSDL. Uh, and when the two organizations were merged to form the Linux Foundation, Jim was asked to lead that. So Jim's charter was provide a home for Linus, uh, you know, nurture this young uh, Linux kernel and take it forward. And boy, did he take it forward. In the last 20 years, Jim and his vision has led us from taking the lessons of Linux and applying it to so many, many different areas, starting with software-defined networking, open daylight, auto-grade Linux, uh, the energy segment, healthcare, uh, AI, cloud native, the list goes on and on. And today, 20 years later, thanks to your vision, Jim, we are 1,000 projects, thousands of members, and frankly, one of the central organizations in technology and open source. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful to call Jim my friend. And Jim, um, so I want to make a personal favor, ask a personal favor of all of you. On the count of three, I'd like all of you to say, happy 20th anniversary, Jim. <laughs> so one, two, three. Happy, happy 20th anniversary, Jim. And Jim. <laughs>You know, we couldn't stop with just wishing him. So Look we think the, this will fit into your home. Oh here. my gosh, I love this. And you know, I got a sneak peek. Angela said we're going to give you something. It might be a penguin, but it's not going to be the kind you hate. Spot on. I mean, it's very tasteful. Uh, with all due respect to Linus, I kind of, you know, I like a little little one like this. This is beautiful. Thank you. Oh my God, I can't even believe it. Thank I'm so you. So excited to Thank have you, you here. How do I, all right, I don't even know how to, keep, wait, I gotta look at my notes now, I'm all flustered. Um, well, it, this is really nice to have uh, so many of you here today that I've worked with for the past 20 years. And so I did think that I would uh, take a little bit of time to reflect on 20 years. Uh, I've been working at the Linux Foundation uh, longer than I've been married which I'll get to uh, in a minute. Not that much longer though. Um, and I thought I would just go back and, and sort of ask questions about why I work here, what we do, what have we accomplished, has it amounted to anything? And uh, you know, I think the first thing anybody asks uh, of themselves when they've been working at the same place for 20 years, Brian Fox here, 17 and a half years at Sonatype, I think uh, many of you have been working in open source for most of your careers, many of you your entire careers. And the question is, you know, why do we all, all do it? And in my case, I grew up in a family of technologists. Uh, the guy kind of in the middle there is my grandfather. He was one of the founders of Cray Research. Uh, he uh, worked on that. This is actually a photo of uh, him getting a, a computer at Control Data, where he, uh, those guys spun out of. Uh, my dad worked on this computer as a programmer at uh, Control Data. So I kind of grew up with technology uh, in the family and my brother and I, uh, we had our own BBS and you know, we kind of loved building our own computers. Uh, I was an early supporter of NVIDIA before it became uh, a massive explosion uh, building gaming boxes. So I feel like I contributed to NVIDIA's rise with all those video games we played. But just growing up in tech, it wasn't the main reason that uh, the Linux Foundation has been such a good fit for me. Um, one of the things that some of you know about me, but maybe not everyone, is that my grandmother 
uh, on my dad's side, uh, also started a nonprofit uh, back in the 50s, in 1953. Uh, my uncle Jim, who I'm named after there uh, on my left, uh, was mentally disabled uh, from birth, and uh, my grandmother was a single mom, and she decided that she would start a nonprofit to help disabled adults uh, get vocational training so that they could go and work uh, in you know, jobs that they're capable of working on, even with their disabilities. And so uh, sometimes if you see uh, a person with Down syndrome working uh, maybe at a Starbucks or somewhere, uh, my grandmother was sort of one of the early leading people in that uh, trend to help uh, disabled uh, adults get uh, vocational training, good jobs, and live you know, a real verdant life. And so when the combination of nonprofit work and tech kind of stumbled upon me, it was like this perfect fit. And that's what really led me to say, yeah, yeah, let me go try this. Uh, and Nithya is right. Uh, I worked initially at the Free Standards Group, uh, which is an organization that was trying to create uh, a standardized way for applications to run across different Linux variants. At the time, uh, you know, Linux had tons of different versions. It was a real problem for its adoption and applications. Uh, the, the Linux standard base had fits and starts. I think it did really good work in promoting Linux and getting it to a next level. Red Hat also uh, did their share in essentially consolidating a lot of the enterprise Linux market and standardizing it in a market-driven way. Uh, but it was such uh, an amazing start where I was working on this sort of quirky open source problem, and I thought, ah, maybe I'll do this for a couple of years, uh, but then just kind of fell in love with the people in the open source community. You know, any of you who've been in open source long enough know how infectious the enthusiasm for open source can be, uh, way beyond the thing that you're actually working on. And so uh, it, it was just something I fell in love with and, and continued to this day. Right around the same time, I fell in love again. Uh, I met my wife, there she is. This was the only picture I could find from 2004. I guess we, we skied a lot when we first met. Uh, I do remember my first blind date with my now wife, Sheila, where you know she's uh, an executive at uh, tech companies and uh, went to Harvard Business School, a very hard charging person. Uh, I told her I worked at this quirky nonprofit. The look of disappointment was <laughs> palpable but I did marry her, and so uh, the two, two loves uh, started at, at the same time. In 2004, it's funny to look back, uh, Ubuntu had their first release, Firefox had their first release, R Ruby on Rails had their first release, uh, MySpace was uh, used quite widely. You know, I'm just, the MySpace reference just makes me feel old. Uh, as many of you know, I'm not super hip on uh, social media, uh, if anybody wants a Clubhouse invitation, just let me know. <laughs> I'm often on Clubhouse, don't know where you all are. Um, but uh, what was else was Lost premiered in 2004 on ABC. I don't know if anyone remembers the show Lost. You know, a collection of kind of normal people trapped on a weird island with strange, unexpected things happening and a fear of giant corporate company. I can't possibly see the connection here to the open source community. But in 2007, uh, as Nithya pointed out, that's when uh, OSDL, Free Standards Group, uh, and other multiple organizations over the years kind of came together to start the Linux Foundation. I think Ted Cho is in the room somewhere around here. Uh, he and I were kind of the two people, I don't know if Ted, you remember this, I don't know where he is. Um, there he is over there. We were in a board meeting, we stepped out into the hall and uh, had this brief conversation about naming the organization. And uh, I don't know who came up with the idea first, I'm gonna te uh, credit Ted, but we said the Linux Foundation, no brainer, right? This unbelievable brand, people love Linux. I mean, to this day when I go in uh, somewhere and I'm wearing a Linux t-shirt or a piece of swag, people are like, oh, Linux, I love Linux. and so. Uh, that was a wonderful brand and, and has continued to this day. About the same time, uh, there was still an amazing amount of skepticism of open source. So for a lot of you old timers, you'll recall 
we all still had to explain why open source was a better innovation vehicle, how it would overcome uh, incumbent proprietary platforms and so forth. Microsoft was still uh, not even a frenemy, an enemy, uh, critical of open source. I, I won't go uh, with repeating all of those uh, quotes. Uh, but many, many, many people, if you've been in open source long enough, you've, you've got to have been told that it's never going to work multiple times. Uh, but we kept at it. Um, and over 20 years, uh, I think that a lot has been achieved. Uh, you know, Linux obviously is now the most ubiquitous software on earth. Uh, it is a grand slam home run. You know, when I started, it was a small percentage of supercomputing. Now it's the entire supercomputing platform. There literally is no other alternative than, than Linux in that world. Uh, enterprise computing, you know, mobile devices. Linux has leapt from one sector of tech to another almost organically. I think that's one of the beauties of how powerful Linux is. Uh, just a, a month ago, we started working with NASA on space grade uh, Linux, which is just another leap forward for the platform. But, you know, it's better to be lucky than good. And, you know, my job at the time was really to create inevitability around Linux by making it look like Linux and Microsoft were these two combatants and that it was this battle of David versus Goliath and we duke it all out. Um, and when uh, Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation, I confided that we never really thought that we would beat Microsoft. It was very difficult to bring a Microsoft workload over to a Linux environment. What we wanted to do was create a perception of a two-horse race in order to disintermediate all the Unix uh, variants and, and essentially you know, kill Sun, uh, Sun Microsystems, um, which mission accomplished. <laughs> uh, because software is an inevitable futures contract, right? You know, you want to bet on the right thing. And if you can show that, like, hey, it's just going to be these two, people would all pile onto Linux, and, and they did. Uh, but just to prove a point, uh, one of my board of directors one time called me an insecure overachiever in that I work really hard and I want to do big things, but I'm so insecure that I work even harder because I never think I'm doing good enough. And so when the opportunity uh, to take Kubernetes and put it in a nonprofit organization came along, I just leapt at that. Uh, I got a call from folks at Google, Brian Stevens, uh, Urs Holzel, and they said, hey, we want to compete in cloud. We've never run a virtual machine, which is the modality at the time for cloud. Uh, go, we'll, we'll open source Kubernetes. We want the Linux Foundation to make Kubernetes and cloud native technology ubiquitous, the new way that people will build cloud applications. And we did it. But I just didn't feel like that was proving the point enough. So I got a call one day from Martin Fink at uh, Western Digital who said, I've got this uh, open source semiconductor instruction set that uh, there's a group of companies behind and we want to make a market around RISC-V. RISC-V is now the fastest growing semiconductor instruction set in the world. Uh, and the Linux Foundation, again, just because I just am so insecure, I want to keep doing this. Uh, now is home to PyTorch, which is really consolidating the market uh, in large language model and machine learning tooling. And so uh, I feel like if I'm looking back, just all the different projects, all the different people that the Linux Foundation works with has been just such a gift. Uh, from the Academy Software Foundation, where Linus and I got to go to the Oscars together, uh, to the networking sector, where Linux Foundation projects are running mobile networks that connect billions of people, uh, just up and down uh, all the different technology. It's been amazing. And, and we continue to grow. Uh, every year, we add more and more projects as open source becomes an important part uh, of everyone's lives. And I, I never thought I would see the day. I had dinner with Mark Rusinovich, the CTO of Azure, on Monday, and uh, we were talking about, uh, this is Scott Guthrie, announcing that Microsoft is joining the Linux Foundation. Back in 2004, if you had told me that this was going to happen, I would have never believed you. But now Microsoft is one of the most uh, you know, important and large uh, investors in open source uh, and has been a very good partner to many, many open source communities, in, including Linux. I would not have ever predicted that. 
And every year, we just kept thinking, for those of you who have been at the Linux Foundation a long time, how do we measure success? You know, we, is it market share? Is it impact in a vertical? And especially with Linux, early on, we kept talking about market share, right? We're X amount of enterprise share. We're Y amount of supercomputing share. But after a while, it just became ridiculous. We couldn't count fast enough. And now I think the best way to, to measure the value of open source software is just to take it all collectively. Uh, and Harvard did this amazing study where they, they've benchmarked the demand side cost at almost $9 trillion in value. It is really the greatest shared technology investment in history. Uh, and I'd like to say that the Linux Foundation has played a small part uh, in that. And uh, it's just amazing to think of how this really has shown those early critics that open source is uh, one of the best in innovation platforms out there. Open source is now 80, 90 percent of any modern technology code base. Uh, and uh, it, it's just amazing to, to see that. And the, the last thing I think in looking back is to ask, how, how did this all happen? How over 20 years do we do it? And this is where I come to the Linux Foundation's culture that I think is a good way to interact with developers and open source communities. First, I will let you all read this quote, but this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. It's on my daughter's bedroom wall. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of emblematic of how you can uh, work well in open source communities, uh, because the nature of open source collaboration is one of critique, right? You, somebody makes a, a pull request, you, you know, critique the code, is it good, is it not? You know, it's just sort of the nature uh, of how that development process happens. And so that extends into all forms of criticism, not that I'm saying a lot of critics are in the room, uh, but uh, it, it's out there. Uh, the other thing that's uh, interesting is my daughter goes to a French school, so that's, uh, the French also teach in a form of critique. So there's just critics all over the place for me. <laughs> Being able to deal with criticism, I think, is very important. And the way that the LF uh, does that, and some of you have seen me talk about this before, especially if you work in the Linux Foundation, we talk about it all the time, is you have to have these characteristics. A, a helpfulness to acknowledge that most of the people that you work with don't work for you or for your company. And you want to be generally helpful to those people in order to get anything done, right? You have to lead through being genuinely helpful. The, the hopeful part is really the optimistic part when, you know, a big journalist in 2007, you know, is saying that this will never work when leaders of huge companies are telling everyone that, you know, all that you're doing is a cancer or terrible. You have to have a sense of optimism that there are better days ahead. You have to always be thinking like, no, we can do it and stick with it and have that grit and determination. And so that hopefulness is really important. But the number one trait that I think is important in working in open source is this idea of humility. Uh, you know, again, I work every day with hundreds of thousands of people. None of them work at the Linux Foundation. Uh, you know, we have several hundred people who work at the Linux Foundation, and many of them, like Linus Torvalds, also don't listen to me. And so it really is a nonstop lesson in humility. And that's OK. I think being able to sublimate your own ego to lead through influence is a hallmark of modern leadership that uh, doesn't just apply incredibly well to open source, but almost every aspect in life. And that really has been the secret for you know 20 years uh, of working here uh, without going totally insane. If you can check your ego, if you can take criticism, open source actually turns out to be a really fun community to work with. So, that's kind of looking backwards. I thought I would take a few moments to look forwards and figure out what comes next, right? 20 years is a long time. I hope I still have a few more years in me. Um, and, you know, a couple weeks ago, I, I saw an article that I thought was really interesting, sort of speculating on succession planning and, and what comes next. Uh, the title of the article was, What Happens When Linus Torvalds Dies? Does any, did anyone see this? Like quite a few, yeah, okay, quite a few, a lot of kernel devs. All right, kernel developers, uh, which one of you wrote that one? Um, but this kind of got a, a bit of play. Um, and I think it's a, a legitimate question. I mean, my question was, 
Um, there have been, over the years, many articles about the bus factor with Linus. I think he has a, a strange fear of buses, um, a lot of speculation about what happens when he goes away. But what's weird is there's never been an article titled, What Happens When Jim Zemlin Dies? <laughs> I think there's like actually a secret group in an article that is more along the lines of, should we kill Jim Zemlin? Uh, but uh, it's always bumping me out a little bit. But seriously, what, what actually is next for, for open source? And um, I think the, the thing I'd like to kind of talk about today is open source has become so ubiquitous. It has become such a fundamental building block of tech uh, that we are starting to enter an era of maturity uh, that's one that we need to get a little bit more prepared for. And, and that is really, these, these aren't the best words to characterize it. I'm kind of working on a better way to explain it, but it, it's, we're entering a regulated era of open source, an era where there's more responsibility, more accountability than perhaps we've ever had. Open source has really had it pretty good for a very long time, sort of unfettered organic innovation in, in a way that's amazing. If you go back and look, you know, in, in, from the 80s to the 2000s, what characterized open source development that was very anti-establishment uh, was um, really a way to emulate existing proprietary software, right? We're gonna be an, a free and open alternative to Windows. We'll be a free and open alternative to database technology. Um, that was really what was going on, trying to build these free and open alternatives to incumbent proprietary software uh, at the time. I was pretty young at the beginning of this. Uh, I worked for some uh, software companies as a, a startup uh, founder um, later, but really, again, open source was seen as this counter to incumbent proprietary software. Starting in the 2000s, though, I think OpenFlow is a good milestone there. There's probably a few others. I'd, I'd throw Kubernetes into this as well. You really started to see open source not emulating proprietary software and providing a, a free uh, and open alternative, but you started seeing real organic innovation happen in open source, where big shifts in technology, whether it's software-defined networking, uh, container technology, cloud computing, uh, mobile technology. It started with open source first. Open source was the vehicle for innovation, particularly in AI. I think that holds very, very true. Open source really is how we got to uh, large language models, these frontier models that we're talking so much about today. That's all built using uh, open source software. Uh, and during this period, organizations, big tech companies, little tech companies all realize that this is an amazing resource and that you can not only go to market quickly by utilizing open source building blocks, but you can really do a lot of innovation. And in the 20s now, I think everyone is starting to recognize that with that you know, sort of nexus of innovation with that ubiquitous deployment of open source, uh, there is a lot more scrutiny that is being applied uh, to open source uh, technology. Uh, I think the early scrutiny from regulators came from cybersecurity threats, right? You know, Heartbleed was the first one, uh, but Log4j was, you know, probably another big wake up call, oddly, like very far apart timing wise that really caused government to start to intervene and say, hey, if the industry can't solve some of these systemic cybersecurity risks, um, we're, we're gonna regulate. And you, know, you saw executive orders uh, in Europe, you saw the Cyber Resiliency Act, you really start to see in cybersecurity an increased set of uh, regulation uh, impacting open source. We also saw a huge increase in uh, IP uh, it claims, you know, patent trolls came come out of the woodwork, and of course they come out of the woodwork because they have, everybody's using open source, and so uh, we saw this big uh, increase in legal activity as well. And you know that that I think is something we all need to collectively think about this week. That sort of the the days of sort of minimal scrutiny of really everything being sort of open and free. Uh, I think that we those days of open and free and collective innovation are still with us but they come with another set of burdens that we need to meet. 
I mean, you know, a day in the life of the Linux Foundation in the last few months has been uh, multiple, almost monthly inquiries from regulators around uh, antitrust concerns in, uh, in and, uh, anti, you know, competition uh, regulators in Europe and the United States, uh, cease and desist letters, uh, lots of uh, work around sanction compliance. I don't know if folks noticed the kernel community had to comply with uh, OFAC sanctions and uh, some developers were uh, removed from the development process. One was actually immediately reinstated when we figured out that that individual no longer worked at a sanctioned uh, organization. But this really has markedly uh, increased over the last few years. And when I look at all of these things, um, one of the things uh, that I think is important is for us to also come together and meet this moment. And it also is an example of why people here in this room are so important to open source. Many of the folks in this room are actually not developers. They're folks that work in open source program offices. They may be heads of engineering who uh, lead open source efforts at their particular companies or work at other organizations uh, within the Linux Foundation or even outside of the Linux Foundation, foundations that support uh, open source development. Uh, and it's all of you who need to come together to meet this moment. Like, I don't think Linus Torvalds is an expert in sanction compliance. I think we need supporting cast to build the tools to help developers wade through these uh, thorny issues. You know, one thing I remind people of all the time is just hosting a meeting like this is one of the largest drivers of the Linux Foundation's budget. I don't think if we gave, you know, the Kubernetes development community, you know, maintainers uh, the money to run KubeCon that they would go do it. And I certainly know that Linus Torvalds does not want to run events. That's the role of foundations. Similarly, regulatory compliance, similarly, legal defense frameworks uh, are things that we need to help conserve and continue this organic flow of code and the innovation platform that we have. I think the Open Source Security Foundation has done a good start of bringing together senior leaders in technology, working with regulators, doing substantive things around securing the open source supply uh, chain. SIGSTOR is a great example of this and many of the other efforts in OpenSSF. Uh, in the coming days, you'll see the Linux Foundation start to publish new papers on how to do sanction compliance, how to deal with uh, regulatory issues in a way that will be helpful, not just to Linux Foundation communities, but other communities. Just last week, I was on stage at KubeCon in front of 10,000 people talking about a new patent defense program that we're launching in, to get developers to provide prior art so that we can work to invalidate patents that trolls are asserting against open source technology. We need to build better tools to allow developers to know each other more effectively. You know, the GN Tan XZ attack is a good example where, you know, a nation state faked an identity, tried to insert a backdoor into an open source project. And the big failure there wasn't that we didn't catch it, it was caught. It was that this person was able to get the commit bit uh, before anybody really truly knew who that person was. And I don't blame the XC maintainers who did that because they're busy and this person had been around, this identity had been around, but no one knew who that person worked for. Nobody had ever met that person. We need to figure out better ways to create trust amongst developers so we can continue this development process. And we're also at the Linux Foundation trying to build tools that can quantify all of this. Where we see maintainer burnout, we can quantify it. Like this individual is getting way too many merge requests, pull requests. There's no way that person could humanly read all of that. That's sort of a red flag. Let's you know go to the management of our collective uh, member companies and say, there's a problem here with this particular open source project that is critical to industry where this person is clearly either just not looking in merging code or, you know, um, is just there's a huge stoppage in the code development because they can't possibly look at all those things. So they're not merging anything. So that's, I think, the, the challenge of our next phase of open source is how do we work in this regulatory environment 
And I think you, you, I hope that you'll see the Linux Foundation over the next few years really providing a leadership role in meeting uh, this collective challenge. So with that, I also want to introduce some new research from the Linux Foundation. Uh, Hillary Carter is here today, I think, somewhere around here. There she is. Uh, leading one of the things that we started a few years ago, trying to provide more insight into trends and challenges in open source. Uh, one of the reports that we're releasing, uh, just released, was on uh, AI uh, and how important open source is in artificial intelligence, uh, how important end users of AI technology see uh, open source, uh, and how open source is driving the scaling of a lot of amazing work in frontier foundation models. Most of this stuff is running on cloud infrastructure using Kubernetes. Another report that we just uh, released is on open source program offices. Uh, open source program offices, I just, I, I hear Berkeley just uh, started an open source program office. Um, open source program offices are popping up all over the place as people recognize that open source is so critical to business. Uh, and we can see a real rise in the adoption of open source uh, program office methodologies. And I'm really happy to see the to do group taking a leading role there. We also did a study recently uh, on open source software developers and how they benefit and how they build their careers by participating uh, in events like this. We talked to a ton of developers and one of the questions we were trying to ask at the Linux Foundation was like, hey, what's our role going to be? Uh, and it turns out that just convening, facilitating events like this all over the world, uh, we, we convene hundreds of thousands of uh, developers every year and have for years and years. That has been a very important source of uh, innovation and career enhancement for developers who see it as critically important to their work. So with that, I want to take a deep breath and introduce a couple of new projects that we're also announcing today. Uh, the first project is the Open Cybersecurity Schema Framework. Uh, so this addresses the challenge of inconsistent data formats across various cybersecurity tools and platforms. Uh, you know, dealing with uh, emerging threats, trying to transfer information about the nature of those threats has for a very long time been a big, big uh, pain. Uh, this group got together and decided they're going to do something about it by creating a way to seamlessly share data across different security systems. And then that will allow to better uh, handle threat detection, investigation, and response. Uh, it's supported by Amazon, Broadcom, Cisco, IBM, Splunk, more. And we really hope this uh, will allow the industry to respond to the that, a hugely emerging threat uh, of bad actors uh, in cyber. We are also announcing a new project uh, coming to Linux Foundation. How many people here have heard of Jupyter? Um, we're, we're very excited uh, to, to have this. Um, and uh, we've uh, got a whole set of supporters that I want to thank. Um, but it's really been uh, an amazing source of innovation. Um, you know, there's just been a huge increase uh, in Jupyter adoption. These Jupyter notebooks are, are critically uh, important. Um, and so we're very happy to be announcing that today. Um, for those of you who don't know Jupyter, uh, it has a rich set of modular components. Um, and I, I want to quickly, I think we, our next speaker is, is going to be speaking on this in detail, so I won't go into it in too much detail, uh, but we're very, very happy to have this project uh, on board. Uh, they are one of the projects that you really want to watch in the uh, AI space. Uh, so uh, with that, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is one of the founders of Project Jupiter. Uh, Fernando Perez, why don't you come up and tell us a little bit uh, about Project Jupiter. Thank you, Jim, for that kind of introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. We're launching kind of a new, a new era for, for Project Jupiter. It's a project that dates back to about 2001, if you include kind of its early history uh, uh, as IPython. And I'd like to discuss for a few minutes 
kind of what is special and different uh, about, about Jupyter in this context. Uh, I'm a longtime Linux user. This is kind of uh, a special moment for us. But Jupyter was a project that was born, as Jim was mentioning, kind of open source world has been a driver of innovation in many spaces. And we were told that we shouldn't do this, right? That, that sentence was told to me specifically by my mentors 20 years ago. Well, we stuck with it. And in 2015, when the LIGO collaboration made the first observation of gravitational waves by observing two black holes colliding into one another, they published that research in the form of a Jupyter notebook that had all the code and the data for anyone to replicate that work. This led to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. I'm a physicist. That was a moment of satisfaction. Um, I'm also a professor at UC Berkeley in data science. and. Jupiter and cloud technology allows us to put the entire stack of science that is used by scientists to get, make Nobel Prize winning discoveries in the hands of freshmen to come to the university and to train them into analyzing data about the world around them and learn with the same stack that is used for these discoveries to do technical work. Many of them go on to work probably at many of your institutions and organizations and companies. And that's the third piece of what makes this project so special, which is that industry has been a key participant in the project almost since the, almost since the start, not from the very beginning, but, but from early on. This is just a sampling of some of the companies that in the past have supported, uh, have supported Jupiter. And what happens in Jupiter is that we bring research, education, and technological development for industry together around the notion of humans. Humans trying to understand the world around them, to solve problems, to collaborate, and to communicate using computation and data. The central tool for communication in Jupyter, for those of you who know about Jupyter, you've probably heard of Jupyter Notebooks. Notebooks are documents that are built combining kind of two strands, right? The narrative built by a human in natural language, in English or whatever your natural language is, together with computation and the results of computation, weaving into a single story around a problem. They're an incredibly effective means of communicating around complex problems. They've been explosively adopted and their adoption continues to grow today. This is data that GitHub published just a couple of weeks ago at Octoverse about the continued growth and continually rapid growth um, of, of adoption of Jupyter notebooks around, uh, around the entire kind of ecosystem of, of repos that exist on, on GitHub. But as Jim mentioned, Jupyter is not just about notebooks. It's a complete architecture of modular components that can be reassembled and repurposed for a variety of different uses, um, all of them based on open standards, open protocols, and open formats that allow you to do new things. So notebooks, yes, are popular and important, but they're just the foundation of an entire architecture that, for example, uh, manifests itself as Jupyter AI, a set of APIs and tools co-developed between the community and industry at AWS to bring AI agents as collaborative parties in this new conversation, where now in, not, not only do you have humans collaborating, you also have AI agents as pervasive elements of your workflow. That workflow may be designing an airfoil or a rocket engine. On the right, we have an example of a CAD application that, is, or that automatically is collaborative because real-time collaboration is baked into the, the, the architecture and the protocols of the infrastructure. And there, one engineer may be working on a graphical user interface for CAD design as, as they're used, but another one is collaborating at the same time using a computational workflow, a scripted workflow, so that they can bring reproducible, scriptable, programmable workflows into this kind of task, and they're working in real time on the same model supported by web technologies, right? Those ideas are now, we're bringing them to the world of GIS. Geospatial data is extremely important and a work worth, as Jim was mentioning, there are still proprietary incumbencies where we want to offer free and open alternatives that are also modern, that integrate AI, that are collaborative and they're web and cloud native. And so we're building tools for geospatial data with Jupyter under the GeoJupyter banner. And finally, on the left, you have, unfortunately, my not so great blood pressure data from a commercial blood pressure cuff that you can purchase on Amazon, going through an application that is available on the Play Store on my phone, making its way into a secure HIPAA compliant deployment of Jupyter to bring this kind of innovation that we've, that we've seen in science and education to the world of regulated healthcare. The reason we're here today, though, is we're launching this uh, participation into the Jupyter Foundation 
And I want to thank the companies that Jim mentioned for making this possible. We're really grateful for your support. The foundation is going to be a new vehicle that combines with our existing governance model. We have an executive council um, that, uh, that uh, focuses on the leadership for the community um, and the overall project, joined with a software steering council that is the technical team around our various sub-projects uh, sub and components. And now the Jupiter Foundation is going to be the third stabilizing stool leg, if you will, in this stool to provide a stable foundation for the project to grow and to continue innovating. The foundation will have a governance board made of the parties that participate. We hope more of you um, will join and it'll give us a stable backbone for this project to continue innovating for sustainability, to address issues in security and release management, etc. And importantly, a place and a vehicle to engage in a strategic fashion between large organizations such as companies or large research enterprises and the project community. So we're very excited. We would love to talk to you off the steering council that the four members who have a um, orange star are here in the room. We would love to talk to you. Unfortunately, Brian Granger from AWS and Darian from Quantstack were not able to be here in person, but the four of us are here. We'll be having office hours today and tomorrow. We'd love to talk to you. And uh, AWS is also giving a talk tomorrow where they'll talk in more detail about Jupiter. But again, Thank you all, and thank you, Jim, for all the great work you've done and the foundation. We're delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is one of my favorite projects because they, um, when they were considering coming to the Linux Foundation, one of the things that happened was public debate about the merits of the Linux Foundation versus other things and so forth. Uh, and. Uh, it was nice to see, you know, on both sides of that argument, the weaknesses of the LF and our strengths. And uh, I feel like we're meeting the moment for y'all uh, and uh, any areas where we can improve, we always want to do that. Last, I have some updates from uh, Europe. So uh, for those of you who may recall this, uh, a few, two, two years ago, uh, we announced our Linux Foundation Europe organization. Uh, this is actually a European-based organization. It has a European-based uh, general manager, we'll call you, because executive director, there's only one. <laughs> now, uh, we have uh, a head of our Europe uh, organization, Gabriele Colombro, uh, who's going to give us an update. The idea here was European organizations wanted to collaborate with a European entity. It was important for government grants from the European Union. It was important for a lot of our members to have that ability to collaborate locally. And we set up a structure that allows LF Europe to do that, but still be a part of the Global Linux Foundation so they can collaborate globally as well. And so Gab is gonna come up and give us a short update on LF Europe. Welcome, Gab. The key word here is short. Um, I'm very, very good at that. So uh, Jim, Jim uh, shared with you our tagline, which is collaborate locally and innovate globally, um, which is more than a tagline. Um, as Jim said, the six now projects of the Linux Foundation Europe are, by all means, global projects. Um, part of the over 1,000 projects at the Linux Foundation. Uh, but there are you know, reasons why uh, it makes sense to host them in Europe. Um, some of these projects are vertically focused on industries that are critical to Europe. And look at Silva. Some of them are very aligned with priorities like the European ID, like the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, some of them make sense in terms of the grassroots community uh, that exists there. And, and of course, as, as geopolitics uh, uh, keeps sort of posing challenges to open source, having a way to host projects in Europe under European jurisdiction, um, it makes sense. And over the last two years, not only we uh, uh, brought uh, six projects to, to uh, Linux Foundation Europe, but we have over 170 members and we supported the sustainability of these projects through European uh, grants uh, in the amount of almost half a million. Um, and in case you're wondering why you only see five logos down there, that's the six projects, it's because today we are announcing a project, the intent to form a project Neonephos. It's a bit of a mouthful, uh, admittedly, but uh, it's a project that I think is very critical um, 
in, I think, explaining why Linux Foundation Europe exists. Uh, this is uh, uh, led by SAP. Um, uh, it is actually part of uh, the IPSYS uh, funding from the uh, European Union. This is a huge uh, 1.8 billion funding that's been spread across uh, uh, different nation states in Europe and uh, organizations to really build an interoperable uh, open source framework at the cloud edge continuum. And uh, of course, this was part of the EU strategy to grow digital autonomy and, and really competitiveness of very different industries in Europe. So as you can imagine, it makes sense to host this in Europe under European jurisdiction. Uh, and so I think this is a great example of the type of projects that make sense to incubate uh, uh, locally, but grow uh, globally as part of the, the Linux Foundation Global Platform. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Check out the announcement or reach out to me over the next few days as we look to uh, uh, get this project off the ground. Um, the other area where, honestly, when we launched two years ago, I didn't think I would spend so much time in sort of policy and compliance, but as Jim said, uh, we are entering the era of, of regulated open source. And so as the Linux Foundation, and particularly Linux Foundation Europe, really trying to harmonize our approach across the different projects that we have, uh, we feel a responsibility to develop uh, uh, tooling and processes that can help upstream projects that you all depend to, to comply with uh, you know, the Cyber Resiliency Act, uh, the, EI, the uh, EU EI Act, and all the other you know, uh, regulations that are coming out of Europe. Uh, therefore, supporting our members and manufacturers that deploy products in Europe. Uh, and of course, through our uh, training and, and education uh, vehicles, make sure that you, uh, you know, clearly are prepared for the regulations that are coming down now between one and three years. To kick off that, uh, we are uh, inviting our members to Amsterdam at the beginning of December. Um, you know, before we take an approach, we want to make sure that we hear from you uh, as to uh, what you need in terms of uh, complying with particularly the Cyber Residency Act. So this is our kickoff event. Uh, uh, there are limited seats and we're almost getting at capacity. So grab your seat today. You can scan the QR code there. Uh, the idea is to kick off uh, uh, to you know, collaboratively hear what you need and draft a plan as to uh, what the Linux Foundation projects and what type of education we can provide to our members uh, to comply with the CRA. Again, check out the code uh, and uh, we'd love to see you there. I'll be there. It's going to be a little cold. It's Amsterdam in December, but it's always a fun town to be. And just to close, uh, if you are a Linux Foundation member, uh, joining Linux Foundation Europe is at no cost. You get a lot of benefits, including joining our advisory board. I'd love to hear from you. And that's where you can get your uh, uh, QR code to join. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. Right. Gab really has the easiest job because it's no cost to join Linux Foundation Europe. <laughs> I spend a lot of time convincing people join the Linux Foundation, which does have a cost, totally worth it and highly valuable, I might add. Uh, so uh, I don't know if all of you caught this, but um, we recently announced uh, a, a few different open source projects. Um, and oh, let's see here, I've got this out of order. Uh, all right, so hold that thought for our next speaker here. <laughs> Uh, but our next speaker is uh, the CIO of JP Morgan Chase's engineering platform and uh, integrated experience uh, group. Uh, it's a so she, uh, she is a software development, uh, developer uh, that is going to talk to us today about the role of open source in, guess, a regulated uh, industry. Please welcome uh, Sandhya Sriran. That's good, that's good. All right, good morning, everybody. It's great, great to be here. So I am Sandhya Sridharan. Uh, I manage uh, the engineer's platform and integrated experience for JP Morgan Chase. So I'm based here in the Valley. And yes, JPMC is a Silicon Valley uh, tech firm as well. 
right? So I've been here for about five years. Uh, prior to JP Morgan, I spent um, you know, in various engineering leadership roles at VMware, Oracle, and started my career at, Auto, um, at Autodesk, uh, building AutoCAD a long time ago. Right, so, so you know, what, what made me come to JP Morgan? Because definitely working at a financial services was not in the line of sight for me. So when the recruiter came calling, I was a surprise because I had no financial services experience. But then as I got to learn a little bit more, I was impressed. Right? I mean, I think the scale, the technology investments, and then just the complexity Right? As an engineering leader, it was really difficult for me to say no, to go and solve large-scale technology problems at, like, at in a, a heterogeneous environment and that impacts a lot of the world's economy. Right? So a little bit about J.P. Morgan Chase. Right? So we have over 150 years of experience building trust. We serve uh, you know, people from around the world from individuals to their local communities to corporations and governments, right? We've always moved at the speed of light and in terms of innovation and also some of a lot of our investments are a true testament uh, to that, right? You can see the magnitude at which we operate. We process $11 trillion of payments daily. Right? We serve millions of people with a wide range of financial services. You know, our reach is vast, and we're constantly looking at investing in best-of-breed technology. Right? We spend a north of $15 billion in technology. So innovation, speed, and disruption is in our DNA. We know that we need to continue to accelerate and innovate to keep up with the, pay, uh, with the uh, pace of change. We're also one of the largest technology companies. With over 45,000 software engineers, we have over 600 million lines of active code. We do north of 120,000 builds daily. We run 100 million synthetic uh, sessions and tests per month. We have over 200,000 external packages deployed in production, most of it op licensed open source. Right? And to make things more interesting and adventurous, we just not have scale. We have tremendous variation in our ecosystem. Our portfolio is written in a variety of languages. You know, we are deployed on-prem, private cloud, virtualized environments, public cloud. You name a tech stack, it exists at, at JPMC. But we also support a wide range of use cases, which comes with its own set of regulatory and compliance requirements and challenges. Right? We also maintain, you know, given our long history, we also maintain a fair number of heritage applications, most of which is in the process of modernization. Right? While modernization gives us tremendous benefits, but the complexity and heterogeneity does magnify our challenges. And we're also seeing a tremendous rise in terms of demand for open source AI models, both from our developers as well as from our data scientists. But we have to be very careful. We operate in a very highly regulated environment and we take this responsibility very seriously. So as I mentioned, we have a very complex application estate and we've been rapidly modernizing across many dimensions, right? But our transformation journey is complex and it's essential that we don't lose sight of security, reliability, resiliency, while all balancing customer experience. So I like to say, it's like, you know, one of my products is called JPMC Enterprise Toolchain, which is short for jet, right? And then, so I like to say that it's like flying the jet, fueling, maintaining, and replacing parts of it all at the same time without destabilizing the jet or, or causing chaos or panic for the crew and passengers, right? So it's a very complex transformation journey. 
And to make, in, right, and also I think many of you in the room will also acknowledge our development environments have gotten extremely complex, right, over the years. Now in, de developers are expected to know what infrastructure, network, firewall rules, and in our case, regulatory compliance requirements. There's a lot of cognitive overload. So really, in order to abstract that complexity and reduce the cognitive overload, we formed a new line of business called Engineers Platform and Integrator Experience that really focuses on a very integrated experience via self-service, uh, deep integration within the IDE, uh, so to reduce that context switching and also provide data and insights at the fingertip of uh, developers in the context of what they're doing. So we have a centralized environment that provides a set of pre-configured tools, frameworks, services uh, for developers to build, test, and deploy. And these come in, term, in, like, in the form of patterns and blueprints, right? These patterns now abstracts the complexity of, say, security, compliance, infrastructure away from the developers, uh, and, but still providing the context so all an engineer can focus on or needs to focus on is generating value uh, with their applications, right? So, all right, so now we built this uh, centralized environment. We formed this line of business. So we have two primary missions for this line of business. One, how do we provide that multiplier effect? Multiplier effect for a software engineer's productivity. And how do we make JP Morgan the most attractive engineering destination, right? And for us, in order for us to provide that, we not only have to have like, you know, a most progressive platform, uh, the best of breed tools, uh, but also the ability to consume and contribute to open source, right? And then like, that's how we are able to accelerate with consumption because we have a lot of challenges uh, to solve. And we want to be able to use what's solved out there, reuse it, and contribute back to the community, right? And also, we believe that open source is also a great in terms of talent attraction and, and retention. So, so what is some of uh, the, the priorities for the platform, right? Of course, generative AI to accelerate development. Right? What do I mean by that? Right? Coding assistance. I know there's a lot of hype in the market, some real, some um, you know, still very early stages. Right? How do we provide? So the platform provides integrated experience within the IDE for, with coding integration, with coding assistance, uh, as well as discover information. One of the key things that JP Morgan Chase engineers tell me, I think which is pretty consistent with what my peers are seeing in the industry too, Developers spend majority of the time setting up environments, second information discovery, right? So I think these are the two big challenges that we are trying to solve with generative AI. Progressive, again, leading to progressive uh, delivery is the ability to have autonomous and self-healing systems. What do I mean by that? Simple use of analytics, simple runbook ad automation, then building that, uh, that muscle and then going into AI ops, where you have these systems that are self-healing uh, for you know, higher predictability, reliability, and resiliency, right? And then as well as now uh, start to cloud in less than two weeks. Now, I think for most of, probably for small companies, they're like, what do you mean two weeks? But we have highly regulated environment. Our applications are very complex. Every region, every country has its own set of requirements, right? Now, to, in order for us to go from our on-prem to public cloud, which a lot of applications are doing, either to take advantage of elastic scale or just to, you know, to use cloud-native applications or to go into a SaaS model. So that's the transformation and modernization journey that the teams are having. So how do we enable that process so which that the compliance, regulatory, all of that is built into the platform? Right, so developers don't have to worry about, you know, or have to learn the depths of, of these requirements. And of course, the best of breed uh, platform tools are of like very little use if you don't have good engineering practices, right? So that's where the engineering excellence and focus is around that. So comprised with good hygiene, engineering practices, 
use of the best of breed technologies and the platform is what will help us get that multiplier effect for our software engineers. Right, now let's try to um, talk about uh, open source governance at JPMC, right? So, you know, I think we have also, you know, we are one of the largest consumers of open source. I mentioned 200,000 external packages deployed in production, right? And then, and also in terms of, uh, you know, we use, we do that because we want to accelerate. We want to have, we, our time to market is critical for us. Reusability is critical for us, right? But again, this adds a lot of risk. You know, I think in, Jim had referred to, you know, all the threats that we have with open source is the software supply chain, right? And I am the biggest platform in, in JPMC that actually ingests a lot of those, whether it is open source packages or vendor products and so on, right? But also historically at JP Morgan, we've had a very fragmented approach to consumption and contribution uh, to the open source community. So two years ago, we formed an open source office and we hired an open source uh, governance uh, head. He's sitting right up here in the front, Rob Underwood. And, um, and my team is really responsible now for establishing policy for both consumption and contribution. Right? This includes procurement of external artifacts, such as Python, Java libraries, container images, and so on, as well as constant inspection um, of it. Right? And then the goal is to really establish a comprehensive risk-based approach in procuring these open source artifacts. Now, we're also a strong believer that open source definitely plays a critical role in enhancing developer experience and engineering excellence at our firm, right? It aids in attracting top talent and also promotes code reusability through both, not just open source, but also it has actually strengthened our inner source uh, practices as well. Now, what are the priorities of our open, uh, open source governance office, right? First and foremost is open source fluency. So we, you know, we believe that open source creates a culture of engineering excellence, right? So how are we enhancing the understanding and expertise of open source for our engineers, right? Definitely documentation, making sure we make it easy. Not, we, first and foremost is making sure it's easy for us to ingest and contribute back by building all of the guardrails in our platform. But I can definitely, you know, kind of awareness through documentation, training through seminars, best practices, conversation, and so on. So that's extremely critical for us. Risk mitigation is the biggest focus, right? So we have a strong partnership with legal compliance and our security teams, because we don't want to leave the interpretation to each of the singular, each of the, uh, the developers, uh, individual developers to interpret. Right, again, any risk mitigation, any risk enforcement, catching of this has to be done all the way to the left, right, at the, the entry door. And it has to be built into the platform. Now, our, also our biggest risks are the open source that's built, that's actually embedded into our vendor products. Right, I mean, of course, you know, the solar winds attack, I think it's still fresh in a lot of our memory. Right? So I think as part of our third party oversight process, we ensure that any new vendor that's coming in, we go through the full list of what are the external dependencies, vulnerability management, all of that that's embedded into uh, a, a vendor software. And it's making sure that it does, never gets into our CI pipeline and it's caught um, at the front door, right? Second is definitely around community leadership. You know, we've also, you know, mindset and culture is very important in this regard, right? Our, you know, we want to be good open source citizens. So the governance office also provides ways and uh, partnerships to how we engage with the community and advocate for JPMC's requirements, right? We want a seat at the table so we can influence the roadmaps for some of the key open source projects. Right, now talking about community engagement, right? So, so we, are, we are pretty busy with, with the community. 
So one of the, you know, again, open source um, governance is to help and steer how we engage with uh, the open source community, right? So we are a member of six open source foundation, all within the Linux Foundation family, right? And then actually the membership uh, and the sponsorship of these memberships is actually spread across the different lines of businesses, depending on the use cases, depending on the charter and the initiatives and the priority that eight lines of businesses are driving. So that's how uh, the sponsorship of these, uh, of these uh, foundations uh, come into being. Right? For example, our corporate investment bank, um, commercial and investment bank is a sponsor of our, is, is the sponsor for the Finos membership. Given the types of use cases uh, Finos has historically focused on. Right? While infrastructure platform function that focuses primarily on cloud infrastructure is an active member of the CNCF. And our cyber uh, security organization is also, I believe, a platinum member uh, and a sponsor uh, for uh, the open SSF, right? So we have been pretty active and uh, we, you know, we want to, our goal is really to influence um, the foundation to make sure that our roadmap, keeping in account, you know, what Jim referred to, like around the regulations and so on, making sure that regulatory compliance is the, and security is first and foremost thought um, of, of, the com of, of this community as well. Right, so now with that, let's pivot to, you know, what's our perspectives on the future and what we think should be some of the priorities for the open source community going forward. Right, safety and security, number one priority. Right, and then it has to be paramount. It has to be table stakes for us. How we do vulnerability management? What do we do? Uh, how do we do dependencies and so on? And we have full transparency on knowing our maintainers, right? Ransomware attacks, still number one threat for us. And it continues to be the case, especially with the nation state actors, right? So it's really important for us to know who the authors are, who the maintainers are. Now, open standards are going to be critical. It allows for better compatibility across different systems, right? And then broader adoption, avoids vendor lock-in, and not to mention cost effectiveness and security and reliability. So that's important uh, in terms of uh, the open standards. Now, open source AI, brand new world, right? And real, I know we really cannot replicate the open source standards of software on AI. There's just too many implications, right? I know we, I think many of you saw the definition of open source AI through open, um, from, from OSI, right? And, but I think it's still very early days. We expect things to evolve uh, quite a bit, right? Things around data use, data entitlements, ownership. So we have work to do there and we have to be thoughtful. Now, open source licensing um, you know, and, and in terms, oh, sorry, I think, yeah. So, and, and I think, right, it's also very easy to say, keep open source open. Now, open source licensing was introduced probably, what, 30 years ago, right? But OSS licensing has become a little bit of a mess, right? License proliferation, compatibility issues, legal jargons, so on, right? So we have to simplify that. Now, it started with the freedom to use software without any restrictions. Now, it's, so it's important for this community, for us, to remember that this started because of you, because of us, right? And we always, I keep reminding myself, and we always have to remind ourselves that where open source really started. And that's what is important to this community, and that's what is important to us as well. So thank you. Thank you. That was really amazing. That was one of the better open source presentations I've seen in a long time. I, I really have to say, um, let's do a quick, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of presentations like that from traditional technology vendors who are extremely sophisticated about how they use open source in the products and services. But that's the best end user uh, approach to open source that, that I have seen in a, a very, very long time. 
Um, I, I think that that uh, final slide about recommendations to the open source community uh, are important. We should meet those uh, moments uh, that, that uh, end users, one of the largest end users of software and technology in the world, uh, is asking us uh, to do. All right. Uh, our next speaker is uh, the one that I was referring to before. Uh, Anandi Bumstead is the uh, Director of Engineering for OpenSearch with Amazon Web Services. You may all remember that recently we announced the OpenSearch project coming to the Linux Foundation. This is another one of those where people say, oh, well, it'll never work. You know, forking code is hard and these projects are really difficult. Uh, but I think we have some good news. Uh, and I'd like to welcome to the stage Anandi. Come on up. And we're gonna do that with open search as well by making sure that people can use and co-produce this software with intention. That everyone who participates in this community can share what they wanna share and keep what they wanna keep. Certainty that the license will not change. Certainty that decisions will be made collectively Certainty that there is an open governance so that we can work collaboratively in the most productive and transparent way. And then support for the community. So I wanna thank all of you, particularly the maintainers of Open Search. I think you're the most important people in the project. That's why I fly to anywhere in the world to sit down and meet with you and ask you how our organization can support this project. We're just getting started. We're in the first five minutes of a long game and we're here to help. Thank you so much. Wow. So I told Jim there's going to be a surprise for him. So anyway, um, congratulations on your 20 year anniversary. Okay, my name is Anandi. I lead the uh, open source, open search engineering in AWS. Uh, today, I am here to talk about the journey OpenSearch has had over the years, um, leading the community and also empowering the community to build the project uh, and the future of the project together. So, I don't know how many of you are familiar with OpenSearch. I'll just give you a brief overview of what, what OpenSearch is. Um, open Search is an open source, community-driven search and analytics and a vector database engine. We have integrated tooling for observability, security, uh, security analytics, um, visualization, and generative AI applications. Um, most recently, we um, Open Search project is part of the. Linux Foundation uh, at the Vienna Summit. Gabriella was there, and in the keynote, uh, we announced the Open Search Software Foundation. And we have a fully functioning governing board and a technical steering committee. And I've had the honor of being the chair of the TSC and leading the technical direction of the project. So, um, I really want to focus today on the journey of open search and over the years, and we'll start in early 2021. So open search was created when Elastic did a licensing change to a more restrictive source available license. And the, use, the users of open search naturally wanted an, a truly open source alternative and AWS made addition to fork. And you know, it was a very interesting time for open search and for AWS. Um, it was a lot of hard work. The fork was immensely complex and it took us it took us a lot of time to figure out how to release the Open Search 1.0 version, and we had to work through over 650 pull requests, 56,000 files, over 4.5 million lines of code, and it 
took us July to release an Open Search 1.0 version, which was fully stable and feature complete. Now, keep in mind, at this time, Open Search was, you know, was the only truly open source search and analytics engine. So we had to do a lot of work to focus on stabilization and interoperability. And, and 2022 came along. And 2022 was, uh, you know, is continued the work of building open search and, you know, building it into all the distributions the community wanted, you know, building the fun, what I call the fundamentals and making it uh, what the community would really want to embrace and love. And it, it was a lot of hard work. And also, 2022 was when we started to really listen and learn. And when I say we, it was the Open Search team and the AWS sponsors of the project. And it, it was, it, it, it really was very hard because we had to go and work to invite, you know, users and contributors to the project. It wasn't easy to build a community like this. And there was a lot of work to listen and learn. And, it, you know, it, it may be surprising to some of you, but AWS, you know, has never taken on a, such a large scale open source project at that time. And um, it, it was hard. And, and also it was, you know, a lot of transformation they had to do to talking within the AWS teams and also outside inviting them to collaborate. And we did, you know, the, the, the collective we, we did the, you know, user communication channels, blog posts, and endless requests for comments. And so, 2023 came along. Now, this is when I joined AWS. It was early 2023. I, I took on the role of the head of open source, open search engineering in AWS. Um, so when I joined, it was interesting to see that open search you know, was fairly successful, but it was still working to rebuild the trust which Elastic um, you know, the trust which was lost when Elastic did the relicensing. And if you guys remember, in 2023 was when there was a rise of generative AI. I'm sure you all of you remember that. And, um, and open search, with its early innovations in its KNN algorithms, was really poised to be in the forefront as a vector database. So it's really, very interesting times. You know, we were in the middle of this momentum of Gen AI, and we are still working to enable and establish trust. And, you know, I think Jim talked a lot about this uh, humility, and also uh, it's, it, it, it was a cultural transformation which was happening within AWS and outside. Because a lot of people were like, you know, what does it mean to continue to build trust with, for open source, open search? Because we're still, you know, uh, part of the AWS ecosystem at that time. And a lot of building trust was to do open governance and actually making decisions in the open. And so, you know, we were really going through this cultural transformation. And AWS actually, surprisingly, just, you know, less than a year into the company, they really stepped up to that challenge and the community around embraced the challenge. And so we created um, a technical steering committee, uh, which was actually was called leadership committee because we were not yet at the uh, part of Linux Foundation. We actually created a leadership committee. We invited a lot of people outside of AWS and we started to make some decisions, not all decisions in the open and we just laid the groundwork for neutral governance. And also, we, I just talked about the rise in Gen AI and the momentum we were seeing. And so it was very important for Open Search, along with its community, to innovate in the open and innovate in the search domain. 
Because at the end of the day, we are a search, search and analytics engine, and we have to innovate in the open and, and get the collaboration from everyone else. So that was really, really important. And we took the time to do it, uh, to really innovate in a lot of the areas around search, what is called hybrid search, and also in the vector database areas, and more importantly, on search performance. And, and you know, it was astounding to see the change by the time, you know, 2023 ended. By the end of 2023, we actually saw the community responding. We saw about 25 organizations outside of AWS contributing to our code base. We had innovations coming in from RN, from ByteDance in our ML area. We had Intel contributing to our codec for Z standard compression, which was contributing to our search performance. So a ton of innovations were happening by the end of 2023. And in 2024, we rode that momentum in, and by the time 2024 came in, there was people like Uber, we have Shanshan and Mingming in the room here. They basically came to us and said, well, we're building a Lucene engine-based search system. It's proprietary, but then we're seeing the work you guys are doing in open search. Maybe we can collaborate together and build together and more uh, you know, you know, complex ideas and like innovations came in just from Uber being its own search company, collaborating with open search. And our, our roadmap just grew ambitiously. We had Slack and Salesforce, they came in and they said, we would like to collaborate. They're also a Lucene, Lucene based search engine, right? So it was amazing. The momentum was amazing. And I'll just give you some numbers. We had about, I think 5,000 monthly user forums views. Our open search org uh, monthly views came over a million, million views monthly. So the, we actually really achieved the critical mass. But we're not done. And what we did was in September, uh, we announced that we are now part of the Linux Foundation, the Open Search Project is now part of the Linux Foundation. And we uh, launched the Open Search Software Foundation with 14 members. As you can see, it's a pretty impressive list. And they are, these are the 14 members in the governing board. And we also have a technical steering committee, which is diverse. We have people from uh, ByteDance, we have people from SAP, RN, Uber, Slack, all of them participating and contributing towards the technical roadmap. So this is amazing, right? In many ways, you know, in many ways, open search, you know, has taken these four years uh, in a community driven way to, and culminated into the open search software governance. And like Jim said earlier on, we've just five minutes into that journey. We still have a long ways to go. And, you know, what I'll say is open governance and being, you know, with this community has really expanded the horizon for open search. And it's also enabled us to really build that trust and build, make it truly open source and keep it open source. Um, now, with that said, we just started, we have a lot to do. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of the open search folks in this audience right here. And we'd love to talk to you. And we'd love to continue this collaboration and make open search the most compelling feature complete search engine out there. So thank you. I love the video. <laughs> I love that a video of me is featured in your presentation. Uh, I must have been really, I must have drank a lot of coffee the day I delivered the open search uh, keynote. Uh, so one thing, uh, please save the date, uh, April 30th uh, and May 1st. 
uh, are the uh, OpenSearchCon Europe in 2025. So April 30th and May 1st, so save the date for that. So our final speaker today is Leonard Rosenthal. Uh, he is the, a senior principal architect at Adobe Systems and serves as their uh, PDF architect. And just to be clear, I don't want anybody going up to this guy complaining about PDFs, <laughs> okay? It would not be the first, I'm sure. Um, m many people might know Ben Marr, who's on the Linux Foundation board from Meta. He created the uh, CAPTCHA technology. Uh, he's got it the worst. So many, so many complaints. Uh, he's here this week. Uh, but um, he uh, took responsibility for the chief architect of the Content Authenticity Initiative, which led him in chairing the technical working group for the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA. Uh, C2PA is one of the fastest growing efforts at the Linux Foundation. It is solving one of the most immediate and urgent AI safety issues, which is uh, how can you believe what content you are actually viewing, things like deep fakes and, and other matters. And uh, he is going to uh, come here and give us a overview of C2PA. Please welcome Leonard Rosenthal. All right. Uh, morning, everyone. I will try not to keep you too long before your coffee and, and snacks accordingly. So as Jim said, uh, what are we? So the, the C2PA is actually very different than all of the other groups you've heard about and will hear about this week. We do not do open source. We, what we do is open standards. So we made that decision early on when we started um, our organization, when we became a member of the Linux Foundation, that we wanted to focus on the open standards aspect rather than on the implementations. And I'll talk about implementations uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, and of course, what we've built. So we have 11 steering committee members. You can see them on the screen. Uh, and as you heard, we have at this point over 500 general and contributor members. Uh, they're not all tech companies. In fact, many of them are things such as publishers, uh, the New York Times, the BBC, the CBC. We also have human rights organizations. Uh, that are part of our group, such as Witness, who keep us honest, to make sure that the technology we are building is usable by everyone around the world, no matter where they may be, no matter what technologies they have available to them. Um, and that's been very important to us, again, since the, our inception. So when did we start? So the group actually started from two other groups back in 2019. Uh, the Content Authenticity Initiative and Project Origin. And we were both off basically trying to solve the same problem when we discovered each other. And fortunately, rather than saying we we're going to compete with each other, we came together in 2020 and through 2021 to form the C2PA uh, as the Linux Foundation project. We've been that since day one, uh, and it has been a wonderful partnership. Um, and has really enabled us to grow, as you heard. Uh, and then within a year, we published the first version of our specification in 2022. And adoption has continued to rise, not only in terms of membership, which is important to us, but also adoption. Um, so we have a lot of people who are out there adopting our standard who are not members. They don't see a need to participate in the standards creation process. They will leverage some of those existing implementations, be they open source or commercial, or even build their own because they can build on top of that technology and that ecosystem that we've built. And, and we're fine with that. That's the whole point of having this available to the world. So what are we focused on? We talk about three pillars. So what we build is provenance technology. You'll hear me mention that a lot. What is provenance? Provenance is simply the facts about something. Where did it come from? What's its history? How did it get there? If you think about this from a physical perspective, if you ever go to an auction house and you buy something, you get that piece of paper and it says, okay, this is where it was created, and this is who bought it then, and this is who bought it you know, next. We want to do that exact same thing. We are doing that exact same thing with your digital content, be it images, be it videos, be it documents, be it audio. 
whatever it might be, we want to provide the technology behind establishing provenance for all of your digital assets. What we do not want to do is detection. Um, we started our work before generative AI was a thing. Certainly it was around, there was no question, but it hadn't reached the media, it hadn't reached the mass, um, of course, that it has today. So we were focused on provenance prior to that. So this idea of general, of gen AI detection, not part of our bailiwick. Now we coordinate with people who do that, but that's not what we focus on. We're focusing on establishing that provenance. We need to educate the world about what we do, about the technology and about where it appears. And another big thing is policy. Uh, in fact, tomorrow, the next two days, I'll be in San Francisco speaking before the first gathering of the International AI Safety Institutes. So we're gonna be working with the world. We have been to establish those policies around the world. I'll be before the European Union in about two weeks focusing on the EU AI Act and a concept called opt-out. Um, how do you determine whether or not your material can be leveraged by an AI? So this is what we do. We focus on the policy and leveraging our technology and others to help the world decide, can it be used and what is it that you're consuming online? So what did we build? What is this specification? As mentioned, it's an open standard for cryptograph, establishing cryptographically verifiable and tamper evident information. And we do that within a defined trust model. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those things shortly. And we gave it a fancy name. It's called content credentials. So this is how we talk about this. We, we used to talk about it. Oh, it's the C2PA standard. It's the C2PA spec. That didn't resonate with people. But as we talk about that aspect of education, content credentials they get. It's a term they can live with. They can understand it. We can talk about it. And it even has a pretty little symbol that goes along with it. Um, I took my badge off, but I actually have a pin on it. You know, so this is, this is the logo. This is what we want to promote and are promoting with the world. So I mentioned we have the specification. We are currently at version 2.1 of that specification. We tend to release about one or two a year. Depends on what's going on in the world, if there's anything high priority. Um, and we're, of course, continuing to, to work on the next generation. This is our core specification. Uh, it's one of two normative documents that we put out. Um, to standards. In addition, we have six what we call informative documents. So we have an explainer and a guidance document. We have a document all about user interface issues. We have a document about threats and harms. This is probably one of the ones that a lot of people don't think about, but we spend a lot of time thinking about how our technology impacts the world and also how people can use it in the wrong ways. Um, and so how do we design around that? And can we even design around that? So something very important to us. Just last week um, is what's in yellow at the bottom. So we sent off our standard through the ISO fast track process to become ISO 22144, fingers crossed that is. Um, but assuming nothing unforeseen happens between now and April 1st, um, it's a really bad date, I didn't pick it. Um, but it, so, well, say April 2nd, it's a much better date. So on April 2nd, assuming nothing bad happens, um, we will be officially ratified as uh, ISO 22144. So that is our expectation. Uh, we believe that will happen. We're very excited about it. And, you know, we're, that's the right thing. And that's what we heard. And just to give everyone an idea, like, why we did this, in talking to people, lawmakers around the world, this is one of the first questions they would ask us. Are you an ISO standard? Are you come from a recognized standards defining organization, SDO? And our answer was, no, but we've got this great thing. Well, sorry, we can't talk to you yet. Come back and talk to us later. So now we can go and we can talk to them. Um, and this obviously is a big deal. And, and I'm happy to talk to folks about what it took to take our work um, in Linux Foundation out to ISO. Um, wonderful process and happy to talk about it. Uh, so let me dive a little bit deeper technologically for those of you who like to look inside. Uh, so we use a container format. Everything we did is based on other open standards. There's very, very few things that we actually invented from scratch. 
what we did was we figured out new and unique ways to take existing technology and bundle it together. So we have these things we call assertions. Those are the statements of fact. They get bundled together. They get digitally hashed and then digitally signed um, and all together into this big package. Um, uses a technology called JUMF, which you probably have never heard of, um, which nobody had ever heard of, but it was this open standard sitting out there waiting to be used. And we said, great, we'll put you to use. Um, and now that standard is seeing more and more adoption because people have found out about it. And so that's, we think again, open standards, just like open source, leverage them, find them, put them to use. Um, some of them have been sitting around doing nothing for years, and it's amazing what you can do with them um, and leverage them, and you don't have to invent that wheel. Uh, so these content credentials go inside of various media types. That's our preference. We prefer to embed them. That way they go along with the media wherever they are, whether those are image files, videos, audios, documents, fonts. This was actually interesting and a good example of the community coming to us. Um, the font community, uh, the font vendors said, this seems like a great idea where we can establish the provenance of our fonts um, because a lot of people unfortunately take fonts and, you know, modify them and sell them as their own. And that obviously doesn't work. So now there's a way to establish provenance for fonts. That also works really nicely as you bring those fonts into documents and take that through the entire life cycle. So uh, they came to us with that idea and it's part of our standard. If you don't want to embed them or in addition to embedding them, you can stick them up in your favorite cloud service. You can stick them on a DLT. You can stick them on a blockchain. We don't care. Um, our goal is to build that provenance record. That is our standard. And then we talk about in our guidance and our other informative documents, how to put it out there, how to serve it. Um, so we have a lot of stuff in there about how to leverage it with HTTP, how to leverage it with Web3 protocols, all of that is all connectivity back to that single provenance record. Um, we also have technology. We have groups working on watermarking, on fingerprinting, and connecting those as well. As I mentioned, this goes through the entire life cycle of the asset. So every time something changes, you create it, you edit it, you publish it, you edit it again, you share it. Whatever happens to your assets, whatever you do to this thing, you or anyone else, for that matter, you might have a co-editing scenario. All of that, you need to include that provenance. You want to keep that provenance up to date. You want to continue to reflect everything that happens. So when the user finally views it, at the end, they see that CR, they see that, that it's got a credential, and they can find out everything about that asset, which leads them to decide, do they trust it? Because at the end of the day, that's the question we want people to ask. Can I trust this asset? And that is a human being decision. Machines cannot make that decision for you, no matter how smart AI gets. You have to make that decision. And I'll give you my favorite example of this. You take a video that no one questions its source. Let's say it's from CNN here in the United States, and you show that to half of the US populace, and they say, great, it's from CNN, I trust it. And you show it to the other half of the US populace, and they say, no chance do I believe that's true. Same asset, no one questions its provenance, but truth is in the human and where their perception and their beliefs come from. So our goal is just to give you those signals. That's what's in that provenance record. It's the signals that you as a human being are going to use to make that truth determination. And we're using the same technology under the hood. We're using X509 certificates. We're using standard SHA hashing. It's all based on that same model that you're used to on the web. You see that little lock icon in your browser, at least for the moment you do until they take it away again. Um, that we understand. We want you to understand this. You open up a PDF and you see a signed PDF. You know what that means. Same idea here. You want to see it on all of your assets. Now, I mentioned we started all of this work before generative AI. It doesn't mean we ignored generative AI. That would, of course, have been silly. Um, this is actually playing a very big role in that industry. And I will say that it's certainly why a lot of people have come to us, joined our group, and, and started adopting the standard. So we have a lot of technology built into the standard to help people identify not only is the asset created or modified with AI, but what regions 
um, were modified by it. We allow you to define what we call the recipe. We have ingredients and recipes. We're very cooking centric in our group. Um, so how did this create it? What was the prompt? What were the other images? What were the other assets that went into it? And then I mentioned this idea of opt out or some people call it do not train. So how do I as a creator say, you cannot use this asset in your training sets? And we have a way to do that as well. Um, and that's something that's going towards, as I mentioned, talking before the EU and hopefully being standardized over there as part of their future work. Maybe. Oh, there we go. All right, so implementations. Obviously, a standard is useless without people actually implementing it. There are a lot of them. I can't list them all on the slide. But what I wanted to point out was that, yes, we have a lot of open source implementations. Uh, my company, Adobe, um, puts one out. Um, the EXIF tool, which you're probably all familiar with, long-standing open source tool, was one of the earliest. We worked with Phil Harvey, does it. The JPEG Trust has one. There's a number of other open source implementations in various programming languages. Commercially, Microsoft, Google, and others have their own internal implementations. Also, and I think this is the most interesting, is hardware is that the cameras are out there. You can buy a camera with this built in. Scanners are about to come out with this built in. So this is, we're seeing major, major adoption across hardware and software. And we've built up an ecosystem. We call them extensions to C2PA. Um, everything from the PDF Association, the Creator Assertions Working Group I will mention because we've, they have partnered with Trust Over IP, which is another great Linux Foundation project. Um, and they've been working on the identity problem. How do you establish human and organizational identity in this type of ecosystem? And we partnered with a lot of other organizations for their needs as well. So, oh, I think right on time or just about. So thank you all very much. Uh, I'm around today. If uh, you want to come grab me, chat some more, happy to do so. Thank you. Oh, I can do that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, it's interesting, one of the things that people don't know is the Linux Foundation is one of the largest standards bodies in the world. We have uh, a very large number of standards development efforts, uh, ranging from RISC-V, which is a semiconductor instruction set, that's a standard, uh, content for, uh, sorry, <coughs> the Alliance for Open Media, uh, video codec standards, CTPA. Uh, we have two ISO standards, SPDX and OpenChain already, now a, a third coming up, April 1st, I guess. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it shows how much open source and open standards are coming together. I think those will be a kind of part and parcel of the same thing in the future and managed by the same people. And we hope the Linux Foundation can be a place that helps standards development organizations partner better with uh, implementation providers. Last thing I want to uh, introduce a... Wait, I already introduced this. Uh, <laughs> There we go. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Arun Gupta's uh, new book. So Arun is here somewhere uh, right there. Arun has a new book uh, coming out on open source, fostering open source culture. Uh, it is a book that goes deep dive into open technology on not just uh, the technology itself, but the people, processes, and the cultures that drive innovation and collaboration. Uh, is it out on Amazon? Go and buy that book, and if you bring it to our March Member Summit, which will also be back here in Napa Valley, uh, I think we can arrange for Arun to sign a copy of that. So please check out that book. I have a few quick announcements uh, before we let you go. Um, so first, we have a coffee break at the Fairway Deck before sessions begin at 1130. Tonight, there is a reception at the estate in Yontville, which is a bit of a distance from here. We're going to have shuttle buses starting at the market and bakery starting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, and they'll circle all the way through 9.30 p.m. Uh, tomorrow and Thursday, we have happy hours at 5 o'clock here on site. Uh, after those, we're going to run shuttles to the Oxbow Market for people who want to go to downtown Napa. Uh, check it out. And uh, as I mentioned, next year's Member Summit, we're going to switch back to our pre-COVID spring. We can't have all the events in the fall, people. Uh, we're gonna, it, it'll be short be, uh, be, until our next one, but in March, uh, the 18th through 20th, we're going to be coming back here to Silverado for our meeting. Um, remember, one, one of the things that I love about this event, Chris Wright, the CTO of Red Hat, uh, will often describe our Member Summit as 
the hallway track, right? You know, the hallway track is the best part of any event. Here, just everyone's important in open source. Many and many of you are decision makers. The whole event really is the hallway track. So uh, take it that way, enjoy the hallway track. Uh, I will be here all week seeing all of you, and I really hope you enjoy the event. Thank you so much.